and breathe. What a week. One more day to go. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Your equity market negative here by 0.6%. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, stocks poised for the longest losing streak of the year, with investors bracing for high rates for longer and economists slashing China growth expectations. We begin with the big issue, the countdown to Jackson Hole. Jackson Hole. Jackson Hole next week. Next week, uh, Jackson Hole. At Jackson Hole, there's really going to be two, two points of focus. It will really come down to Powell to be uh, on message. Don't really think that we're going to have, we're going to hear uh, a big change in narrative. You're getting a Fed that was hawkish and raised rates very substantially. What is the Fed ultimately looking for? They're likely to take a look at supply demand imbalances in labor markets to decide how much more, if at all, they need to adjust the overnight Fed funds rate higher. Lean on to, into a hawkish bias still. A FOMC participant should be looking at the last three months worth of data. The Fed has done so much already in terms of delivering those hikes. These are not going to be kind of near term policy decisions of what they may do with rates uh, next month. Rate hikes at the September meeting. Maybe the Fed doesn't need to hike. We are not certain that the last hike is behind us. The Fed keeping rates higher for longer. The Fed will have to be more aggressive raising rates higher and keeping rates higher for longer. We get lucky on Fridays. Joining us now to recap the week, Mohammed al Erin of Queen's College, Cambridge. Mohammed, so much that you and I need to discuss. This bond market move, China, Jackson Hole next week. Let's start with this bond market move. Mohammed, from your perspective, what's behind this monster move, not just of the last week, but the last month? In order of importance, John, supply, first and foremost, followed by a revisiting of the growth prospects to stronger growth, followed by a recognition that inflation may be sticky over the longer term. And then finally, people are keeping an eye on what's happening in Japan. So you've had these four things come together. Supply has been the main drivers and the others have contributed. Mohammed, given the reasons you offer, are there also reasons to believe then that these kind of levels are sustainable? Yes, John, but a lot will depend on what, Ch what Chair Powell decides to do next Friday. And he has a range of choices. Um, he can talk about short-term monetary prospects, he can talk about longer-term monetary prospects, or he can punt both and focus on some of the challenging economic issues facing um, the U.S. economy. But what he says is going to be critical in terms of what it does to the bond market. The other thing to keep an eye on, and you've mentioned it, is China. I don't think people recognize enough that you've had two long-standing problems coming together. First, pockets of debt and leverage becoming systemic. And second, an inability to generate high and genuine economic growth. And suddenly, these two things are merging and risking financial instability a la Chinese. And that's something to keep an eye on as well. Well, let's break down those two things and we can start with China and then we'll work our way back to Jackson Hole and Chair Powell's address about a week from now, 10.05 Eastern time. For those of you not familiar with the time, that release came out just yesterday afternoon from the Federal Reserve. China's done a range of things this week, Mohammed. I'll go through a few of them. China has delivered the strongest pushback in the FX market with a really strong fix for the currency overnight. We know they requested state-owned banks to escalate intervention to support the currency, based on our reporting. We also know that mainland exchanges have asked some investment funds to avoid net selling of equities. They've even asked some companies to buy back stock. Mohammed, it seems like it's all insufficient. What do they need to do to draw a line under all of that? So what they're trying to do, John, is, is to stop these problems, the debt overhang and the growth issues becoming financial problems. So everything you've cited is an attempt to short circuit the financial instability. But that's not going to work unless they address the two fundamental issues. And you and I have been talking about this. On the growth side, then the model middle. Um, they're not sure whether they want to do more of the traditional stimulus, which ultimately will not work, 
or do they focus on the reforms, which pushes down the growth drivers, something that politically is difficult for them? On the other side, on the debt side, they haven't dealt with a fundamental restructuring of the debt. So these small problems are becoming systemic in nature. So unless they address these other two issues, all the things that you've mentioned um, are not going to prove sufficient to avert financial instability. Already we're seeing outflows out of China, and that for them is a big issue. Ben Laidler of eToro wrote a line yesterday, Mohammed, and he said something like, it's an economic giant, it's a financial market minnow. Is this an economic giant we need to pay attention to or a financial market minnow that we can ignore? And what I'm getting at here, Mohammed, is whether this is a contagion issue, whether there is a prospect that this bleeds out into broader markets worldwide or not. So it won't bleed out through the financial channel, so because financially they're not as big um, as they are economically. But keep an eye on the economics. You know, now the global economy is almost wholly dependent on the U.S. economy. The U.S. economy is the bright spot. The U.S. economy is an economy that is growing and growing in a genuine fashion. Europe is having difficulties. The U.K. is having difficulties. China now is decelerating. Um, so it is all about global economic growth and how much of the burden can the U.S. continue to shoulder, because China is now a detractor to global growth. You just said, Mohammed, the global economy is highly dependent on the U.S. economy. Can we flip that? And I'll ask a question. How dependent is the U.S. economy on the global economy? Can we continue to see strength like this in the U.S. with weakness elsewhere to the places you pointed to? We could. Um, the U.S. has the privilege of being a large, relatively close economy, well-diversified, entrepreneurial. So, yes, we could. It's harder because exports do contribute to economic growth. It is harder. But, yes, absolutely, we could. And that has been the story of this year, is that the U.S. has continued to do well and it's accelerating, even though the rest of the world has been very sluggish. So the title next week, as you know, Structural Shifts in the Global Economy, which takes us to point two in Jackson Hole and Chairman Powell. Is he central banker to the world? To borrow a question from my good friend Tom Keane, do you think he is this week, Mohammed, into next week? The Fed has always been central banker to the world. The F we issue the reserve currency. We manage other people's savings because we have the most lit deepest and most liquid financial markets. Um, so, yes, the U.S. Fed has enormous influence on the rest of the world. Look, John, you, you're going to make me front run yet again an FT article coming out on Monday. But Chair Powell has three choices. And it's not clear to me what he will opt for. What, what we know is he has lots and lots of topics he can, he can cover. Short-term topics, longer-term topics, tactical ones, secular ones, structural ones. He has a lot to choose from. Ultimately, it's not clear to me what he will do. If he picked out the structural reasons, Mohammed, if he picked those out, are there structural reasons to make the argument the rates can be higher for longer than we have truly broken out of that pre-pandemic, post-GFC regime that we were in for the best part of a decade? Oh, absolutely. And you've heard me say this. This is a different global economy. Um, this is no longer an economy where aggregate demand is deficient. This is an economy where there's insufficient aggregate supply. We feel it in the labor market. We feel it in terms of the supply chains being rewired. We feel it in terms of the energy transition. And the list goes on. So yes, this is structurally a very different global economy. And that's a problem because the framework is directed at an economy with, with insufficient aggregate demand. The inflation target, as you've heard me say, may be too low for this world. So yes, there's lots of reasons to argue that this is a fundamentally different economy, but it raises critical aspects in terms of monetary policy. Well, let's talk about the monetary policy call for September, which sounds boring compared to what we just discussed. Is it too early to make a call as to what they may or may not do a month from now, given we still have one more CPI report? and another payrolls report around the corner? I think it is. Um, they've told us over and over again that they are highly data dependent, and we have to respect that. So we have to see what the jobs report and what the, what the CPI inflation report is going to say. 
CPI, September 13th, for those following early September, you get the payrolls report. Mohammed, if we can finish on the market, I think we should. Equities today are down about a half of 1%, off the highs of July by about 5% on the S&P 500, on the Nasdaq by a high yield spread still incredibly tight. What do you think explains that, Mohammed, given the challenge we see developing in the bond market with rates of 5% at the front end, close to 450 down the longer end of the curve just yesterday? Isn't that a challenge? to this risk appetite in equities in credit? It is a challenge, but I think we have to put it into context, John. Um, you know, when we were talking back in July, there was a sense of the market overdoing the romance with the soft landing narrative. And it went too far, both on the bond side and on the equity side. So I see this as a give back after a month of excesses, excessive romance with the soft landing. Step back, John, if I had told you in the beginning of the year that the S&P would be up 14 percent, that the Nasdaq would be up 27 percent, um, I think you would have said most investors would have taken that. So, I, I, you know, it's important to keep a perspective on this. I think what you're seeing here is, is people are realizing that it's not going to be as simple as the soft landing narrative that the market fell in love with back in July. An excessive romance. Mohammed, it's good to see you. It always is. Mohammed, thank you, sir. And a tease of the FT column coming out about a week from now. And I don't work for the FT, so I'm happy to get that sneak peek of what's in that column about a week from now. Looking at equities at the moment on the S&P 500, we're negative by a 0.6% on the S&P with some movers. Here's Abby. And John, we are also in the worst four day stretch since early March. So let's take a look at what is dragging this morning, starting out with the shares of Estee Lauder. Despite beating the uh, estimates for the last quarter, the stock is down about uh, 7%. This as the outlook misses uh, on duty free sales lagging in Asia. Tesla, though, one of the big drags this morning, down uh, 2%, heading to a sixth down day or 10 out of 11 days down about 25 percent or more from its recent peak those uh, price cuts recently plus just a consolidation of this year's big move there's also litigation around a 2019 autopilot accident so lots weighing on tesla and then finally deer down two percent a big beat and raise company a uh, quarter out of this company john but it's interesting analysts are always looking ahead saying that this could be the peak for deer that we're at the peak of the ag cycle and that margins may not be sustainable abby thank you more from Abby around the open and bow coming up all eyes on Jackson Hole. If you look at just the theme for next week, Jackson Hole, it's not sort of the what's happening in the economy right now, but what is happening structurally with the global economy. These are not going to be kind of near term policy decisions of what they may do with rates uh, next month. That conversation coming up with MUFG's George Concarvis and Zach Griffiths of Credit Sites from New York. This is Bloomberg. has three choices and it's not clear to me what he will opt for what what we know is he has lots and lots of topics he can he can cover short-term topics longer-term topics tactical ones secular ones structural ones he has a lot to choose from ultimately it's not clear to me what he will do that was Mohammed just moments ago discussing Chair Powell at Jackson Hole next week. Central bankers and policymakers gathering in Wyoming with the Fed chief in the spotlight just one year after predicting pain. While higher interest rates, slower growth and softer labor market conditions will bring down inflation, they will also bring some pain to households and businesses. These are the unfortunate costs of reducing inflation. But a failure to restore price stability would mean far greater pain. For a preview, Ira Jersey joins us now. Ira, what happened to that pain? <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it it was less painful maybe than uh, than Chair Powell thought. And, you know, I agree with some of the guests that have been on your show this morning at, with the idea that long and variable lags have just gotten longer. And th there's a variety of structural reasons for that. So, it, you know, it, I and I agree with Mohammed as well. Like, it's, it's a little bit unclear what part of the economic outlook Jay Powell is going to focus on next year. Um, I, I assume that he's going to talk more about the medium to longer term as opposed to the very 
short term, although uh, it, it would be pretty surprising if he didn't at least reiterate what he said uh, at the last press conference, talking about um, you know that more interest rate hikes might be needed, that uh, that that, int that policy had to remain restrictive for a long period of time in order to get uh, inflation down. So it'll be interesting to see if he does talk about medium term economic outlook, how he thinks that inflation will develop over time, whether he talks about uh, the housing market, if he talks about the labor market, and you know maybe even talks about some supply chain issues that could continue to creep up here in the economy. The door is wide open to say whatever he likes. Structural shifts in the global economy. Ira, thank you. Ira Jersey, good to catch up. Looking back to last year and thinking about what he might say this year. Let's continue that conversation with George Concarvis of MUFG, Zach Griffiths of Credit Size. George, let's start there. We were promised pain to deal with this inflation issue. Haven't really seen much pain at all. Now, George, either those lags are super long or maybe we just aren't sufficiently restrictive. George, which one is it? Oh, John, it's, it's the lags. And let's be honest, we had the 10 year sub 4% throughout this first half of the year for the most part, right? We're only now starting to see an actual move higher in rates. It's the bear steepener that gets you. I've mentioned it a few times before. And we're in that pain period. The normalization of the belly of the curve is really what gets the economy. Zach, is this the period for pain? Well, the bear steepener certainly seems painful and has been more aggressive than we had anticipated, but the U.S. economy is holding up very well. We don't think that means the Fed has to hike anymore at this time, but the real question is how high do they have to remain or how long do they have to remain this high in terms of the policy rate? This move's been phenomenal over the last six days, about 20 basis points. The 10-year at the moment, by the way, down about a basis point to about 4.26 on a two-year, just short of 5%, breaching that level in the last week at about 4.93. George, the pushback I often get on this program about higher interest rates is that it's unsustainable, that we can't sustain life above 4%. Well, we've done it for 13 consecutive days at a close on a 10-year. George, why can't that continue? But it can continue, and I think we probably will for quite some time until something breaks much more materially. I mean, this is this is a negative feedback loop between what's going on overseas with the dollar, and the dollar will strengthen through this, and the and the lack of kind of uh, access to dollars, and what that does to potentially maybe selling of treasuries, those that need to actually uh, source dollars, and the fact that we have a massive fiscal impulse that both kind of extended this business cycle. Let's be honest. I mean, if it wasn't for the government type spending, we would not have had as robust of a recovery. If we didn't have rates sub 4%, we would have had a strong housing market in the first half of the year. Now we're in the second half of the year. If rates keep rising or stay at these levels, this is where it starts to bite. Deficits matter, and they matter in expansions because money goes elsewhere. George, that's what's missing here. Usually in a downturn, when you get deficits starting to expand, the deficit doesn't matter so much because do you have that risk aversion driving people into treasuries? In an expansion, George, have you ever seen, and I've asked this question before, deficits this large with unemployment this low? And are these the prices, the yields that we need to get to to get that additional supply away? Look, ironically, typically it's a private sector that does the slowing down, but this time it's going to, the restrictor and the governor of economic activity is going to come from the econ from the government side because they've been uh, such a large fiscal impulse and the spending on par to like wartime periods. I mean, it's not sustainable, number one, but that's what really matters. It's going to be the interest cost and the ability to continue spending like this, which I think, you know, we think it's not going to happen. Zach, how does that compete with what's happening in credit right now? Credit has been incredibly resilient. And when you think about the primary markets, they have remained open. Spreads have been even tighter than we had anticipated them to stay. We did recently shift to a market weight recommendation from overweight for IG credit. So we do think the risks are a little bit more balanced. And frankly, we're a little bit more comfortable taking duration risk at these levels versus credit risk as we think some of the economic optimism going forward has shifted a little bit too much in that optimistic direction. And we're getting a little nervous that with Fed policy remaining this high for this long, can the economy really remain in expansionary territory throughout that period? period. Zach, have you been surprised by how tight spreads are near the tights of the year so far? It's incredible, John, when you think about just how much volatility and rates we've had, and you really haven't seen spreads blow out or move materially wider. I think part of that is fundamentals are strong. So we do have a constructive outlook overall, but we think the probability of further spread compression here is very limited, skewing the risk towards spread widening. That's why we shifted to a more balanced outlook in terms of credit. George, you said things break. Things have broken this year. Let's be clear about that. Some banks broke down back in spring. We just seem to move on from it. 
pretty quickly. George, any reason to believe that those issues come back to the surface all over again? Have we truly moved beyond all of that from earlier this year? Well, that's the irony. The irony is the longer we wait and the fact that the Fed's going to be on, uh, on a, such a high level for, for longer, it, it will kind of fester and potentially expose some of those risks again, both in the banking system. But again, I'm really more focused on overseas factors and you know, what's going on with the dollar and access to dollar liquidity. And I think that's where it matters more. We've lived in a world where U.S. funding was cheap for, for multiple decades now. At five plus percent, foreigners are going to have to pay up for dollars. And I think that's going to matter. So, George, just build on something that's been developing in China, the currency intervention. Is there some connection there between what may happen with China in the FX market and what may happen in the Treasury market domestically here in America? Look, I mean, I think that there's uh, a, you know, a managed decline, a very targeted focus out of the Chinese policymakers and authorities to try to really take care of what's a homegrown issue. But on the FX side, I mean, the, the currency is going to matter. And, and, and of course, I think if there's a need for dollars, then you, know, you have to then sell. And, and really what I'm really more concerned about is like, the U.S. bond market is not like the gilt market. It's a much deeper market. It's globalized. It's a dollar reserve currency. But we could have our LDI moment, too. And that could come from the FX markets. George, just describe that. Go a step further. I've got a minute. We can play with that. What does that look like? I mean, that looks like when you need to defend your currency, you start to go into an actual sell program and you start to raise dollars. And, and unfortunately, most of the bonds that are out there in the system in the foreign markets are primarily in the belly of the curve, which is the part that has to normalize the most versus Fed funds. It's, you know, Fed funds is at 550. We have still the whole curve under 5%. So you focused on China, on Japan. George, where's the focus? It's Asia, 100%. George Concarvas, Zach Griffiths. I wish we had more time, George. We spent 10 minutes talking about that. George, thank you. Thought-provoking stuff going into the weekend. Coming up in the morning calls and later, State Street's Laurie Heinel making a case for staying overweight equities, even with this mess in the bond market potentially developing. That conversation coming up shortly. Your equity market near session lows. We're negative here by 0.6%. Five minutes away from the opening bell, equities are lower here. Near session lows on the S&P 500, negative by 0.6%. That's the price action. Here's some morning calls. Your first one from Morgan Stanley. Downgrading Affleck to equal weight, seeing limited upside due to the stock's lofty valuation. That stock down 1.3%. Wells Fargo upgrading Hawaiian Electric to equal weight, $8 price target, saying the recent sell-off has created a more balanced risk reward. And finally, Edward Jones downgrading Cigna to hold, growing increasingly concerned about mounting competition within the pharmacy space. We're down there about 0.4%. Coming up, Americans keep on spending, but the country's biggest retailers doubt it'll last. We're wrapping up a busy week of retail earnings with State Street's Lori Heinel. That conversation coming up next. Your opening bell just around the corner. Three-day losing streak on the S&P 500 about to become four based on this. We're down by 0.7% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down one full percentage point going into the opening bell after the biggest three-day slide on the Nasdaq 100 going all the way back to February and poised now for a third week of losses on the Nasdaq, the longest losing streak on a weekly basis on the year so far. Let's your opening bell, switch up the board and get to the bond market. The epicenter of the equity pain has been in Treasuries. Yields are just a little bit lower this morning to 426.84 over the previous six days though up every single day and up over those six days for a gain of more than 20 basis points on a 10-year this morning 426.84 after the highest closing yield going back to 07 on tens and going back to 2011 on a 30-year in the fx market the dollar showing a bit of strength the euro some weakness 108.59 going into the ecb on september 14th who knows what the fed's going to do i've got no idea what the ecb 
ECB does from here with a soft backdrop for growth and stubbornly high inflation, 108.59 on euro dollar. Into the commodity market, crude positive here by a half of 1%, $80 and about 75 cents. About 50 seconds into this one, fourth day of losses on the S&P. We're down 0.7%, down about one full percentage point on the Nasdaq. The one stock to watch in the open is this one. It's Dia, the company raising its annual profit outlook with demand remaining strong. The CEO saying this, fundamentals are expected to continue fueling solid demand, supported by a strong advance order position. Abby has more. Morning, Abby. Hey, John. Well, this morning we were looking at the worst day, or moments ago at least, for deer since early April. Now it's the end of July, but investors clearly not looking at that demand or the big beat that they uh, produce. In fact, numbers really stellar for this company. They put up uh, $10.20 in one quarter in adjusted earnings. That beat the estimate by 25%. Uh, percent. That is a monster beat on $14.3 billion of revenue, a 1.2% beat. So a very strong quarter. They also raised the outlook net income. But Oppenheimer is saying that that guidance from Deere implies a more muted fourth quarter. Uh, and this has to do with some analysts thinking that we've seen peak agriculture, that the best is really uh, kind of here for Deere in terms of the Russia-Ukraine war that that set, sent uh, crop tire and U.S. farmers scrambling to buy their machinery. Well, something to keep in mind now, John, we do have some of the grains down sharply. In fact, wheat this year down more than 20 percent, its worst year since 2008, perhaps supporting this idea that we have seen peak ag on the year. Deer is now down about 3 percent or so, underperforming the S&P 500 dramatically. It's down 2 percent this morning. Abby, thanks for that. This one just dropped in my inbox from Bank of America, the title of it from Mike Gapen and the team. It's a scorcher. Here are the bullet points of it. This week's data flow was red hot. He pointed to July retail sales, industrial production coming in well above expectations, pointed to the FOMC minutes that came out on Wednesday afternoon, called them balanced but a little stale, and added this looking ahead to Jackson Hole and Chairman Powell. Powell should sound less balanced at Jackson Hole since the latest data rise the risk of a fresh increase in inflation. Chairman Powell in Jackson Hole, 10.05 Eastern Time, a week today. Let's stick with the earnings. Applied Materials issuing a bullish forecast, signaling the chip slump may be easing. The CEO said this, over the past several years, we focused our strategy and investments on key technologies to accelerate the AI era, enabling us to consistently deliver strong results in 2023. That stock is up by about 1% this morning. Let's turn to the utility sector. Shares of Hawaiian Electric rebounding after providing an investor update in an SEC filing, saying the company's goal isn't to restructure. Joining us now to discuss Bloomberg, Simone Foxman. Hey, Simone. Hey, John. Yeah, if the gains that we're seeing this morning hold, this would snap an eight-day losing streak with a stock lost almost 68 percent of its value. But this investor update appearing to give uh, traders a little bit of positivity here. The company also saying that it intends to be there for the long term. Uh, it's also restored power to about 80 percent of affected customers. However, 1,900 people, it says, still without power in Maui. Something else that may be driving the stock this morning, Bloomberg reporting late last night uh, that the that Jefferies uh, is among the bond brokers that has been sending out quotes for uh, private placement notes at deeply distressed levels, 40 to 60 cents on the dollar. But this could be a signal that the company is really moving forward with trying to grapple with the kinds of losses it faces uh, as a result of these Maui wildfires. Of course, plenty left unknown. And of course, the pg and &E uh, bankruptcy example still lives large. Moody's also cutting as the uh, rating of, of Hawaiian Electric to junk last night. That stock up by almost 12 percent, about five, five minutes into the session. Just to double check the clock there for you, five minutes into the session. This move this morning following eight straight days of heavy declines for the stock. Wells Fargo stepping in saying they've seen enough, upgrading shares of Hawaiian Electric to equal weight and writing the following. With a depressed valuation, we think the risk reward is far more balanced in what is a highly volatile situation. We believe these are scenarios, albeit seemingly remote, where significant upside exists. That stock is up by 
9.6%. Let's turn back to the earnings. Estee Lauder delivering a weak outlook, signaling a slower than anticipated recovery in its Asian travel retail business. The CEO saying this, we're taking actions in Asia to capture demand from the returning individual travelers and continuing to reduce inventories as we navigate the current market headwinds. Katie has the story. Morning, Katie. Good morning, John. Yeah, Estee Lauder taking a beating on the heels of that report, currently off about 5% from the bell after delivering that disappointing outlook. Let's get into the numbers first because the fourth quarter adjusted EPS actually came in at seven cents versus estimates of a loss, while revenue beat expectations as well. But the company warned that fiscal 2024 adjusted earnings will be $3.43 to $3.70 a share. That is below the consensus estimates. And Estee Lauder, it also said that net sales will decrease by 10 to 12 percent in the current current quarter from a year earlier. So those are the numbers. Let's get into the why, because the beauty company had said that ongoing weakness in its duty-free business in particular, in particular in Asia, that is, is expected to overshadow the sales growth that it sees in markets such as Europe. And specifically, Estee Lauder said that too much inventory after misjudging demand from travelers in both China and South Korea this year is going to weigh on the bottom line. It's the duty-free business, primarily in Asia, that makes up about a third of Estee Lauder's revenue. So that's weighing on guidance. That's weighing on the stock this morning. For the year, Estee Lauder down almost 40 percent. They have not had a good time of it at all. Katie, thank you. That stock is down by another 4.9 percent. The concern there, as Katie indicated, on Asia, potentially on China, much more so in the months still to come. I want to turn back to Bank of America and some of the numbers they've put out recently, just in terms of the global economy and not just the U.S. economy. This is what they've got to say this morning. Global data is gradually confirming our view that the main economic blocks are likely in the process of decoupling. The title of this research, the decoupling continues, but can it last? They point out, as we all know, the U.S. remains strong, China continues disappointing at the margin, and global investors are becoming increasingly concerned. They say this going forward, it is likely this decoupling continues or the negative impact of a China slowdown impacts the U.S. outlook. I guess pick your poison, but that's going to be a debate for us, not just the domestic economy in Jackson Hole next week in our coverage when we're down there in Wyoming, but also on the global economy. Can we decouple or will that China slowdown actually start to weaken the rest of the world? About seven minutes into the session, just a snapshot of the price action for you. We are negative by half of 1% off the lows on the Nasdaq. We're down by 0.9%. Into the bond market, six days has been relentless over the last month, but the last six days particularly, six consecutive days of yields higher on a 10-year. The 10 year this morning, down about a basis point to 427. Let's turn to the earnings. A host of retailers topping earnings estimates this week, but delivering a warning to investors about the outlook. Walmart CEO saying this, rising energy prices, resuming student loan payments, higher borrowing costs, tightening lending standards, and a drawdown in excess, excess savings mean that household budgets are still under pressure. Got a similar message from Target, stating the consumer is still taking a very cautious approach to discretionary spending. Student loan payments will cause additional pressure on already strained consumer budgets. State Street's Laurie Heinel joins us now to wrap this up and look ahead. Laurie, great to catch up with you, as always. This year, I said it this morning, it's been like the economist who cried recession, and now it's the retailers telling us this is truly it. The consumer's going to hit some headwinds. Do you think they will? Well, we don't think that consumers are hitting too many headwinds yet. Certainly, they're spending on savings. Uh, certainly, they're pivoting their expenses from you know, goods to services. And so that's part of what you're seeing in the retailers. But as long as employment markets remain strong, which they continue to do so, we think that the consumer still has legs. You and I have talked about the prospect for a soft landing. Is there such thing as too much of a good thing? Is this data <laughs> too hot? Well, it is too hot through the lens of what does the Fed then do? One of the big conundrums is that the inflationary pressures just are not coming down as fast or as durably as what we had hoped uh, earlier this year. And so that's going to keep the, the Fed kind of on watch. Uh, we actually think they've done enough already, but as long as some of this data comes in strong, and especially as we see third quarter GDP be, being strong and we see inflation pressures not really abating, the Fed might feel compelled to do some more work. And Chairman Powell, according to Bank of America, should sound less balanced to Jackson Hole since the latest data raised the risk of a fresh increase in inflation. Is that what you think is going to be the driving force behind that speech a week today? 
We do. And look, the trajectory on lowering inflation is not going to be a straight line. There are likely to be bumps in the road. We're going to lose the benefit of some of the base effects that we saw earlier in this year. And so we're likely to see episodes where inflation starts to become a little bit higher again. Again, we believe that the Fed has done enough already. But given the fact that they were late to the game, it's likely that the Fed will remain more hawkish than perhaps is ideal. Only two weeks ago, we were talking about being in a soft spot, in a sweet spot for a soft landing, Laurie. Has anything changed in terms of your outlook for the equity market? Well, we still think that there's a trajectory here. And in fact, we think a hard recession is really not likely at all. And every month that we go by where the um, employment picture remains strong, inflation starts to look like it's starting to abate, um, central bankers maybe are getting to the end of their tightening cycle, that gives us confidence that we can't, could actually see, if anything, a, a very minor type of recession in 2024, but even perhaps a soft landing. So we do still have hope and we remain constructive on risk assets more generally, uh, but certainly it's a very precarious world out there right now. You have retained one hedge and it's gold, Laurie. <laughs> Why is gold the hedge of choice for you? Well, look, gold is one of those few things that actually provides diversification against this backdrop. As we see, when equity markets are selling off, we're seeing bond markets sell off at the same time. And so you want something in the portfolio that's going to react very idiosyncratically to the rest of the portfolio. So gold is one of the few places where you can find that. Laurie, do you think that's the risk that we get a repeat of last year for 60-40 investors, that your bond allocation and equity allocation can fall simultaneously, given what's developing? Well, we don't think we're going to have a repeat of last year. And in part, that's because the starting point is a lot better. So if you think about bond yields with a four handle, uh, that provides a lot of protection. You're getting some nice income there. If you look at adding credit to that, the credit spread has been pretty durable. So we don't think we see a repeat, uh, but certainly we could be entering a period where you have very muted returns across the board. It's felt like it this week, that's for sure. Laurie, thank you. Laurie Heinel there. Of State Street on the latest, about 12 minutes into the session. Just an update for you on the equity market. We are negative by 0.5% on the S&P, a fourth day of losses, potentially on the S&P. There's a lot still to play for for the rest of today. On the Nasdaq, we're down by 0.9%. In the bond market, yields have been higher all week, every single day this week. We're backtracking just a touch by not even a basis point on a 10-year. 427 right now on a 10 year in the FX market. Some dollar strength out there for you. The euro now just about holding on to 108. 108.58 and negative 0.1% on that currency pair. Coming up on this program, the former president taking Fed Chair Jay Powell to task. I'm not a fan of uh, yeah. Jay Powell. I would not reappoint him. Uh, I thought he was always late, mm. whether it was good or bad, but he was always late. Uh, I was surprised he was reappointed. We'll catch up with AMH, down in Washington, up next. I'm not a fan of uh, yeah. Jay Powell. I would not reappoint him. Uh, I thought he was always late, mm. whether it was good or bad, but he was always late. Uh, I was surprised he was reappointed. I was very tough on him. Mm -hmm. And if I wasn't, I think we would have had much higher interest rates for much longer. Presidential candidate Donald Trump speaking with Larry Kudlow on Fox Business yesterday, taking a shot at the Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell. This ahead of next week's Republican presidential debate in Milwaukee. The president, the former president, still hasn't said whether or not he'll show up to the event, saying, quote, if you're leading by a lot, what's the purpose of doing it? I guess that's a question we've got to go ask going into next week. One man who will be on that debate stage is Governor DeSantis of Florida. And this is what he has to say on Chairman Powell. We need to rein in the Federal Reserve. It's not designed or supposed to be an economic central planner. He's gone on to say it is not supposed to be indulging in social justice or social engineering. It's got one job, maintaining stable prices. And it has departed from that with what it's done over the last many years. Joining us now, I'm pleased to say, Bloomberg's Anne-Marie. AMH, the former president, not the only one taking shots at the current Federal Reserve chair. What do you think that actually looks like in practice if one of those individuals is in the White House? Well, it's a great question because, of course, Powell has a term till 2026. So if one of those individuals was to go to the White House, 
Do they fire him? Remember, Trump in 2019 said he should be able to demote or fire uh, Jay Powell. And then one of his most brazen critiques of the Fed chair at that time said he didn't know who was worse for the U.S. economy, Jay Powell or Xi Jinping. So this duel and drama between Jay Powell and the former president is not new. You'd have to be living under a rock if, if you didn't know how Donald Trump felt about Jay Powell. But it does bode this question that other candidates are going to have to answer. How do they feel about how the Fed has handled the economy? It's been a difficult few years for the Fed, obviously coming out of COVID-19 and this handling of inflation. And now the rate hikes, the path of the aggressive rate hikes we are on. So DeSantis is in the Trump camp. The governor is saying a hard no, he would not reappoint him. But then there's others like Governor Chris Christie, who sat down with us and said he didn't think Jay Powell did anything horribly wrong. He would consider it. Obviously, he thought he was a bit late on inflation. But then we spoke to D uh, Doug Burgum yesterday, Jonathan. This is the governor of North Dakota. He is running on an economy first um, campaign, but he would not speculate about any future appointments. But he doesn't like the way the Biden administration handled inflation. Let's talk about next week. If you're leading by a lot, what's the purpose of doing it? The former president's words about attending the debate next Wednesday. What are the arguments for and against for his team attending that debate? Well, I think if the president was to show up, he would take the oxygen out of the room and potentially he has a chance to leave, e lead even further in the polls. Um, he's also an individual that probably doesn't want to be left out and wants to dominate. And the only way to do that is to show up and dominate, dominate alongside those other individuals on the debate stage. But at the same time, given the fact that he does have this wide lead in the polls, He's thinking, do I even need to go there? And there's a CNN report that they are leaning towards not showing up, but they, of course, at the same time saying we could change our minds at the 11th hour. And potentially he just does his own counter programming. And then Republican primary voters will have to flip flop between the two if they want to see an array of different voices on a stage or just want to hear what the former president has to say. Let's get those names on the screen again and go through them. Anne-Marie, give us the guide for next week. From your perspective, the names to watch outside of the obvious, Governor DeSantis of Florida, who would you be looking for? Well, I'm really interested to see how Senator Tim Scott uh, plays this, because he's putting millions of dollars at the moment following this debate um, in ad campaigns. And he sees potentially a way that he can have an uptick um, in the polls following the debate. Also, Vivek Ramaswamy, this is an individual that we know from troves of document, uh, documents from a super PAC that is um, helping and advising uh, Governor DeSantis. They're saying that he should hit Vivek very hard and defend Donald Trump. So it'll be interesting to see how Mr. Ramaswamy deals with that, especially as his numbers have really been rising in the polls. MH, thank you. An update down in Washington. It's good to have Anne-Marie back. Anne-Marie Hodern there in Washington, D.C., our chief Washington correspondent. About 21 minutes into the session, equities are negative here by 0.3% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we are lower by 0.7. Into the bond market, Treasury shaping up as follows, with yields lower by about three basis points on a 10-year. 4.24 on a 30-year here, down by about two basis points to 4.37. With some sector price action, here's Abby. So we are off the lows for the S&P 500 to your point, John, down just three-tenths of 1%. Moments ago, we had actually more sectors higher than not, and we could actually, and we do actually right now in this moment too, as industrial flip-flops between very small gains and losses. Up top, though, consumer staples a bit defensive, up just four-tenths of one percent. To the downside, though, communication services, one of those mega-cap tech sectors, down 1.3 percent. Tech down uh, eight-tenths of one percent, and discretionary down half a percent. So those mega-cap tech sectors getting beaten down once again today. Now, on the week, so many different superlatives, as you know. Uh, the worst four days since March, the worst week, I believe, since February. These are the worst sectors. All 11 sectors are lower. Discretionary up top. I think Tesla has a lot to do with that down 4.2%. It'll be interesting to see if and when that stock, not if, when that stock gets a break. And then real estate, this is interesting because maybe in uh, sympathy with China or it could just be the fact that yields are higher and those dividends look worse, John. Abby, thanks for the update. What a week we've got coming up for you next week. Think about what's on the horizon on the agenda, on the earnings front. NVIDIA, just explosive gains through the year so far in 2023. On the political front, we've got that debate in Milwaukee, the first one for Republicans coming up on Wednesday. That, by the way, hosted by Fox News. And then on the macro front, who knows what's going to happen with China. But one thing we do know, we're going to hear from Chairman Powell, scheduled to speak next Friday in Jackson Hole, Wyoming at 10.05.
Eastern Time. About 23 minutes in, equities lower, your trading diary up next. choices. Um, he can talk about short-term monetary prospects, he can talk about longer-term monetary prospects, or he can punt both and focus on some of the challenging economic issues facing um, the U.S. economy. But what he says is going to be critical in terms of what it does to the bond market. This hour, moments ago, Mohammed Al Aaron on the bond market on Chairman Powell going into Jackson Hole next week. The price action trying to recover from three days of losses. Will it become four? Let's see if this sticks. Let's get to the trading diary. The week ahead looks like this. President Biden heading to Hawaii on Monday to assess the damage in Maui. More retail earnings Tuesday with results from Macy's and Lowe's. Then the first Republican debate taking place on Wednesday in Milwaukee. The earnings event of the week, NVIDIA reports after the close later next week. Jackson Hole kicking off on Thursday with Chairman Powell speaking on Friday. From New York City, that does it for me. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV and good luck for the rest of the trading day and enjoy your weekend. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.